All right, well, I'd like you to turn with me today, please, if you would, in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 18. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 18. And we're going to read to the end of the chapter. So from Acts 18, 18, down to verse 28. And it begins this way. It says, and Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila having shorn his head in Senshria, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. And he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep the feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you, if God will, and he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them, and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he had disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, whom, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word. Our topic uh, this uh, day is a simple one. It's Paul and John's disciples. It's really a part one of a two-part series because we're going to see in chapter 19 and verse 1 through 7, uh, we see John's disciples again mentioned, and we're going to see them here at the end of this chapter, one of them particularly, and that is Apollos. And as we consider that topic of John's disciples, we have to remind ourselves in a sense of the book of Acts, that it's a book of transition and change. And as we consider that, we think of the massive changes that were taking place after 1500 years of Judaism. Uh, now God has introduced something new called the church. And it wasn't easy for people to make that change in their minds. Uh, change is always difficult. Uh, we're moving from Judaism to Christianity, from law to grace, from the expectation of a messianic kingdom to truth concerning the church, which is his body. And so it's this time of change and transition. In the midst of all that change and transition, there were some people who were kind of caught up in between. It, it, there was a famous uh, radio commentator uh, that many would have heard of in the United States. His name was Paul Harvey. And he used to tell stories, and he would tell this really interesting story of somebody's life, and then he would stop, and there'd be a commercial break, and then he'd say, and now for the rest of the story, and he would give kind of a tremendous impact. Well, if we think about people like Apollos, they'd heard a lot of information from John the Baptist, and they believed what they'd heard, but they hadn't heard development since then. <laughs> And so what they needed was somebody to give them the rest of the story. And so that's what we're going to see with these John's disciples. They, they had they'd responded to light and they had responded passionately to light and believed what John had taught them. And yet uh, they had then gone back, uh, in this case, uh, in this in Apollos to Alexandria, and they hadn't heard what had happened since they had left Judea and they needed somebody to help them. And so that's kind of the the background to John's disciples that we have to consider. But before we get to that important topic, we want to think about the uh, Paul's return to Antioch and the conclusion of the second missionary journey, and then the commencement of the third missionary journey. So a lot of kind of events happening in the first half of this little section that we're looking at. And so we, we read uh, again in verse 18, 
that it says Paul after this tarried there yet a good while and then took his leave of the brethren. So he's leaving Corinth. And of course, uh, he's been there, he tells us, for a good while. In fact, uh, we know from verse 11 that he was there 18 months. Uh, it says Acts 18, 11, he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. And of course, that's up to this point, the longest place he's been anywhere, teaching the word of God, 18 months. Uh, it's going to be uh, exceeded when he gets to Ephesus the second time. He's going to be three years there, but he's 18 months there. And of course, uh, there's reasons why he stayed a long time in Corinth. One is he didn't get kicked out, which has been the usual pattern as we've gone through the book of Acts. In fact, he enjoyed a measure of protection, as we saw earlier in our study, from the proconsul of, proconsul of Achaia, a man called Gallio. And so he he didn't allow the Jews to uh, cause uh, problems for Paul. And then not just uh, this protection, measure of protection from uh, this man Gallio, but he also had the promise of the Lord Jesus that nobody would harm him. And again, we saw that in chapter 18, verse 9 and 10. Then spoke the Lord to Paul in the night by vision, be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee. No man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in the city. So he basically enjoyed 18 months of unmolested freedom to preach the word of God without the usual riots and uh, attempts to, to force him out of the city. So it says he took leave of the brethren. He leaves uh, Corinth. And of course, what a lovely term. He took leave of the brethren. Now, remember the Lord Jesus was the one who instigated this delightful term that's used of those that have believed in, in the Lord Jesus. John's Gospel, chapter 20 and verse 17, uh, we read the Lord uh, saying in verse 17, he says, Jesus said to her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren. Say to them, I ascend to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And now that, that new kind of title, that's the title given to all of us that have believed in the Lord Jesus and his death, bell, and resurrection. Uh, he is not ashamed, it says, to call us brethren. And so we're, we're thankful for that. That's a delightful title. And of course, is considered a title for all those that are true believers in the Lord Jesus, not exclusive to any one particular group, but those that have trusted in Christ were his brethren. And so we notice that as he leaves uh, behind Corinth, he takes Priscilla and Aquila with him. Uh, they go along on the journey. And uh, it tells us, uh, again in verse 18, it says, and sailed thence to Syria with him, Priscilla and Aquila. That's going to be very significant for what we're going to see in the rest of this particular chapter. Uh, they're going to become headquartered in Ephesus. They're going to be, in a sense, a backbone of the work in Ephesus for several years. And so a very key couple uh, that are going along with Paul, and we'll see that later. But notice as well, something, again, which highlights the transitional period we're in. It says, Paul having shorn his head in Centuria, for he had a vow. And so it would seem that Paul had taken, prior to this shaving his head, he had taken the Nazarite vow when he was in Corinth. Uh, perhaps the reason for that uh, remember this Nazarite vow from Numbers chapter 6. It was a, is a vow of devotion, of somebody devoting themselves to the Lord. They're saying, Lord, I, I love you so much. I don't care about my appearance. Uh, I don't care about other relationships. He wouldn't touch a dead body. I don't care about uh, human pleasures, earthly pleasures. He doesn't drink any fruit of the vine. And so he's, he's just uh, somebody who's devoting themselves uh, fully to the Lord. And it was a vow given for a certain time. Well, I want to suggest to you that, that when in Corinth, Paul took the Nazarite's vow. You might ask, well, why did he do that? What were some of the reasons for that? Perhaps it was that if you remember when he went into Corinth, he was at a very low state. He'd come from Athens. He'd come from uh, all the difficulties that he had been entailed prior to that. And he, he tells us that he was there in weakness and fear and much trembling. And perhaps uh, in his low condition, 
he's left uh, he'd been left alone uh, in Athens all these kind of things uh, perhaps he he rededicated himself devoted himself afresh to the Lord and took this Nazarite's vow and the Lord had clearly answered and blessed his time in Corinth beyond measure as a result of this uh, this vow and now it was time to fulfill the vow now what did they do to fulfill the vow well they had to shave off their hair because again the normal thing in scripture is for men to have short hair in fact the bible says if a man has long hair it's a shame unto him it's only it's it's exceptional for a person to have long hair one of the exceptions was if somebody had taken the nazarite vow so he, he has his hair shorn because of the in connection with this vow but the next thing they did once they had taken the hair off they would go to jerusalem and they would present that hair along with an offering. And uh, that would complete the vow. And so we're going to find that he's on his way to Jerusalem in time for the feast. Why? To bring this vow to a close. So that's basically, it was presented with a burnt offering and offering sacrifices in the temple. And he's about to do that. And so one thing that would tell us, uh, this would tell us is this, that despite all the Jewish opposition to his preaching, it had not made him anti-Jewish. He still was Jewish in his mind and his thinking. Uh, he never forgot that. Uh, his Messiah was Jewish. His scriptures that he had used were Jewish. And he was still influenced by that. Now, we would say that he was militantly opposed to Jewish traditions being enforced upon Gentiles, and he would fight that tooth and nail. But as a Jew himself, uh, he valued some of these uh, traditions. And of course, we've got to remind ourselves, most of all, that he, he says, to a Jew, I became a Jew. <laughs> Why? That he might win all. He wanted to reach all men. So, so in, in order to reach these, uh, he says, I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And so by doing this, by going to Jerusalem, uh, he, he gives him opportunity to, to reach the Jewish people and take away any suspicion uh, that he's a Jew hater now that he's rejected uh, Judaism as a whole and become the, the one who is bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. So he's heading to Jerusalem, uh, now the, uh, the capital city of, of Judaism, and he, he's going to go there with a express purpose uh, to complete his vow, but also uh, we're going to see an opportunity to present Christ at one of the prominent feasts. So notice he says in verse 19, he says, and what, he came to Ephesus. Now, it, it's quite interesting that Ephesus in Asia, he had tried to go there once before, and the Spirit had forbade him. If you notice back in Acts 16 and verse 6, it says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. But now he's in Ephesus, which is in Asia. Now we got to think of in those days, Asia was Asia Minor. Uh, we're not talking about the Far East here, but we're talking about uh, what is now Turkey and that area uh, considered to be Asia Asia Minor. And so he, the Spirit had forbidden him to go there, but now he has complete freedom to go there. And so it's timing. It might not be right to go to a place at a certain time. The Spirit of God said, no, it's not your time. But the very same place could be the, the, the place for him to go at a different time. We're going to see it was God's time for him to go to Asia. And we're going to see the reasons why. Uh, especially when we get into chapter 19. So he says he came to Ephesus and he left them there. That's a Priscilla and Aquila. They set up their tent-making business there. That's going to be a base of operations in the future. When he comes back uh, from his trip to Jerusalem and then to Antioch, he's going to come back there. No doubt he'll stay with them. They're going to be good at following up some of the things that occur uh, in this uh, opportunity that he has in the synagogue. And so notice he says in, in verse 19, he came to Ephesus, left them there. He himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews as his practice was. Remember, to the Jew first, he always went there. But a marvelous thing happens. It says they desired him to tarry longer time with them, but he consented not. Now, this is a, unusual, right? Usually, 
They don't want him to stay longer. They want him out of there. They don't like his message. In this occasion, uh, in complete contrast, they they actually want to hear more. And yet, amazingly, he says no. You think, well, Paul, this is an open door. Come on. They want to hear more. Why are you leaving? And, uh, well, he's going to tell us the reason why. Verse 21, but bade them farewell, saying, I must, by all means, keep the feast that comes in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. So uh, they wanted him to stay, but he said, no. He says, I must go. (laughs) I've got to go somewhere else. I've got to go to Jerusalem. Um, And so... Uh, of course, you ask yourself the question, why Why must? Why must he go? Well, we, two, two reasons. Um, first of all, uh, there's the must connected with the completion of the vow. Now, remember what Scripture says, if anybody vows a vow and they fail, fail to fulfill it, it's very serious consequences for doing that. God emphasizes that. If you just give you one example, a very beautiful verse in Ecclesiastes, Palm, Palms, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and in chapter 5, and verse 4 and 5, we read this, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Well, he's made a vow, yeah. and to, to complete that vow, he has to go uh, to Jerusalem and present the hair along with the burnt offering and complete the whole thing. So, so first of all, there's a must connected with the vow. But then there's the second must, which is the must of opportunity. Because he he's going up there for the feast. Notice he says, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep the feast that comes in Jerusalem. Now, why is it important for him to be there at this particular feast? Well, again, remember, here's a man who says, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. When are you going to get the most number of Jews together in one place where you can present the claims of Christ to them? Well, the feasts, all male Jews were required to attend these feasts, weren't they? And so you're going to have a lot of people there and of course, this particular feast, uh, Bible scholars are pretty much united on believing that it was the feast of Pentecost that he was heading towards, and uh, he's got this must of sharing Christ with them as he goes there. Of course, um, th- the timing was essential. Why he couldn't linger in Ephesus was if that is if they're correct in suggesting that. Uh, he must, because there's a kind of time restraint here to get there for this particular feast. And the reason for that is this. The treacherous Mediterranean weather closed what was called the Great Sea to shipping until the middle of March in the winter months because it was so treacherous. Passover that year, AD 52, was early in April. And so there was a need for haste to get there in time for Passover. But he promises to return. He says, I will return again unto you. Again, verse 21. But then he kind of prefaces the promise with these little words, if God will. Because we understand that, don't we? Uh, I think more than ever since the, um, the COVID pandemic, I think we understand God willing with more clarity than we ever did before. I have my schedule and I've got all these meetings booked and all the rest of it, even plane tickets bought. But it's all God willing. Who knows what next pandemic they're going to put down the pipeline that's going to shut the doors again. Who knows? That's not a prophecy, but uh, they they know that it (laughs) it gives them a lot of power when they do that. So it wouldn't surprise me. And there's talk like monkeypox, all this kind of stuff. All I'm simply saying is this that it's always good for us to say God willing. The only person who never had to say God willing was the Lord Jesus because he knew that everything he did (laughs) would be on schedule, would be perfectly timed, and it was the will of God. He always did the will of God. He knew what the will of God was, and he completed it perfectly. 
He's the only one who doesn't have to say, if God will. But we have to say, if God will. Verse 22, it says, and when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up. Now, it doesn't say where he went up, but you don't have to do that. Anybody knows that that phrase gone up is a technical term, because wherever you are, you go up to Jerusalem. That's where he's going. That's where he's going to do the vow. And so it says, when he had gone up. And, and notice he says, when he had gone up and saluted the church. Of course, uh, the church in Jerusalem. Not only would he have gone there to fulfill his vow, he would have also have gone up and greeted the Christians there. And from there, it says, he went down to Antioch. That's where he was sent out from initially. This is where he's reporting back after his second missionary journey. And so he has greeted the church in Jerusalem. He's fulfilled his vow. He has then gone back to complete this missionary journey that began in Acts 15, uh, verse 36 through 41, and now has concluded the second missionary journey. The next verse, we're going to start the third missionary journey. So we notice, uh, again, verse 28, after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order strengthening all the disciples. Now, again, Bible scholars believe that he spent a full year in Antioch, probably from the summer of 52 through the spring of 53. And then um, what uh, this third missionary journey, he, he really begins a journey uh, back to Ephesus, some 1,500 miles to the west. <laughs> so you think of his journeys. Uh, th these are lengthy journeys. Uh, of course, he revisits churches that he had previously seen established in Galatia and in Phrygia. And so we, we notice that he goes through these regions of Galatia and Phrygia. And notice the what his purpose is. First time he went through, he had a very specific purpose. That was to preach Christ, to see lampstands established, to, to, to get a work beginning. His second pass through now, he has a different purpose. Notice what it is, strengthening all the disciples. Not saying that he didn't do evangelism, but his primary purpose of this this return trip is to strengthen the disciples. And I suppose if Paul was still around today and he came to visit your assembly, the first thing he would probably do is say, well, how can I strengthen the Christians in this assembly? How can I make them stronger followers and learners of the Lord Jesus? What can I do to make them to strengthen their walk uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ? And, it, and it's good to think about that. Uh, am I somebody that's concerned about strengthening the disciples, want them to be stronger believers, to have more confidence in the word of God and more confidence in the promises of God and more confidence in the gospel of the Lord Jesus or to make people stronger in their faith, especially because if people are weak, they they're, they can be unstable and they can be very wobbly spiritually. We want people to have a firm foundation, to, to have good, strong roots down. We want to strengthen the disciples. And so that was his goal. And uh, so he went through strengthening all the disciples. And so meanwhile, while Paul is doing all this, back to Ephesus, what's going on in his absence in Ephesus? And so we notice in verse 24 that a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, Alexandria, an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. Well, Paul leaves Ephesus, enter stage, <laughs> uh, comes Apollos. And we learn some things about him. Uh, first of all, he's from Alexandria, the second city of the Roman Empire, of course, named after Alexander the Great, uh, located in Egypt, uh, North Africa, 114 miles northwest of Cairo, uh, known as a great center of philosophy and culture. And what we know about it from those days, and again, we know this from secular history, is that it had a huge Jewish population. In fact, many believe up to a third of the population of Alexandria were Jews. Very interesting. Uh, and so uh, also a very intellectually wealthy city. Uh, excavations have uncovered uh, in Alexandria a library of over 700,000 volumes. <laughs> so it was a place of learning, place of philosophy. Uh, it became a great center of Christianity. Tragically, 
it also became the center of Gnostic heresy as well. And so that came out of Alexandria. Uh, there was a time I used to say, could any good thing come out of Alexandria? But I've had to correct that statement because clearly Apollos <laughs> was a good thing that came out of Alexandria. But it was, it became a hotbed for sure of the Gnostic heresy. What's interesting too, though, is it's also a place where because of the huge Jewish population, the, the first ever Bible translation from one language to another was done in Alexandria. And that was 150 years approximately before the birth of Jesus. A group of 70 scholars got together and produced something that's known as the Septuagint translation, the first translation from the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, which was, of course, the language of a city named after Alexander the Great would obviously be Greek. And of course, uh, so anyway, that's a, an interesting city. But this is where Apollos was born. And he was obviously born with certain gift. He was an eloquent man. <laughs> he had a way with words and uh, able to keep people spellbound with his brilliant oratory, as well as natural gift. Notice something else. It says he was an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. Now, to become mighty in the scriptures is not a gift. That takes work. <laughs> to, to know the scriptures well, uh, to be able to uh, use the scriptures and marshal the evidence and present the facts powerfully with conviction, that takes work. So you can have eloquence but you may not be mighty in the scriptures. In fact, um, it's a tragic thing. You could have somebody who is very mighty in the scriptures and not very eloquent, can't get the message across, can't communicate it. On the other hand, you could have somebody who's very eloquent and they have nothing to say. They say it very uh, uh, with great eloquence, but there's, there's no substance to it. And, and so uh, the, the, it's ideal when you have somebody who has both this eloquence and has done the work and is mighty in the scriptures. And here's such a man, Apollos. He can marshal the facts, present them powerfully and with conviction. And so a tremendous communicator of the word of God. And notice it says in verse 25, as we learn more details about this man, it says that he was instructed in the way of the Lord. So he knew something about the Lord. In fact, we know that it, he knew the baptism of John. So he obviously the baptism of John, uh, he was preparing people for the coming of the Messiah. He had obviously been one of those who repented and was baptized in, in, in anticipation of the coming Messiah. Maybe even heard John say, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. And he, So he knew quite a bit of information, but obviously not everything. He didn't know the great truths uh, that Aquila and Priscilla knew because they're going to tell him the way of God more perfectly. He's going to give him more details. What we do know is he was passionate about what he did know. Sometimes I think uh, we there are other groups of believers who may have less light, but they have a lot more heat. <laughs> and they're more passionate with what they do know than other groups that have a lot more light, but are not very passionate <laughs> about it. And so here, here's a man, he, he doesn't have all the information. He doesn't have everything together. What he does have, he is passionate about. In fact, he says he was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit. That word fervent is a very interesting word. It means at boiling point. The guy was just boiling over with enthusiasm for what he knew and communicated it well. He spoke and taught, taught diligently the things of the Lord. That word diligently, it's the idea of accurately. What he knew, he taught it with enthusiasm, and he taught it with accuracy. Oh, that's tremendous, isn't it? And yet, he only knew the baptism of John. In other words, there's other things that he doesn't fully understand. But again, wouldn't it be good if we were passionate about the light we had? Sometimes we think, oh, if I just had more, you know, people are ever learning, never coming to the knowledge of the truth. They're always wanting some more information. 
And maybe the Lord is saying, well, why don't you get serious about what you already have? And then I'll give you more information. But it would be nice to see you taking serious what you you already have, doing something with what you have. And so he he was doing what he could with what he had. And so uh, he he did that. And of course, remember, this is the transition time. Uh, he he doesn't, you know, you can imagine he he perhaps uh, well-traveled man probably went down from Alexandria into Judea as a Jew. He would have gone to the festivals and would have heard about John, gone out and heard John in the desert, one of those groups that went out to hear him and, and responded wonderfully to what he heard. And then he goes back to Alexandria and Life goes on. There's there's more things happening. There's the great truth of his death, burial, and resurrection of the Savior, uh, his rising again, his 40 days teaching uh, those uh, truths to the disciples, beginning at Moses and all the prophets. And there's a lot of stuff he didn't know. And then, of course, Paul getting these heavenly revelations uh, concerning the church, which is his body. All of this stuff, Apollos didn't get. And so... Uh, but nevertheless, he is passionate about what he does know. But then we come to verse 26. He's visiting Ephesus. And of course, uh, the synagogue model was that if a visiting uh, Jew from another area came, they would often ask them, do you have any word for the company? Okay. And so he obviously has an opportunity to speak to the to the company in the synagogue and it says he began to speak boldly in the synagogue who when Aquila and Priscilla had heard they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly so he was teaching passionately in this, and they heard him and I'm sure it was a delight for them to hear somebody so passionate about what they had heard but they take him home which is when he, they took them unto him uh, again maybe this is my imagination running riot here but I suspect they just took him home for, for for lunch and then they sat around the table and they said brother we really appreciate how you shared what you shared and all the rest of it but do you know that some things have happened since you visited Jerusalem that you may want to know? And so they taught him the way of God more perfectly. And so just an interesting thought here. Uh, we, we talk about this man. And one thing you have to say is that he's a humble man and he's a teachable man. His might in the scriptures and his eloquence did not leave him puffed up with pride. Because he might have said, hold on a second, who do you think you are? You're tent makers. I'm this mighty orator from Alexandria, and you're telling me I don't have the story right, I don't have all the facts. But no, he he clearly listens and takes on board what they're teaching. Now, I want you to notice something else. It says Aquila and Priscilla had heard they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Oh, what's going on here? You see, we would say without hesitation that the scripture says in connection with ordering the church, very clear how to behave in the house of God. I suffer a woman not to teach, nor to usurp authority of the man, but to be in silence, right? Scripture is very clear on that in terms of in the church. But what about in the home? Well, it seems like in the home, around the meal table, both Aquila and Priscilla expound to him the way of God more perfectly. There's a difference between church order and home order. So that, that this lady Priscilla can also share with this man without ever getting out of biblical order or, you know, uh, and help him. And she does. Uh, we have many happy memories of our early days in Ireland and, and new converts and having them around for lunch and lots of questions. And my wife and I just filling in gaps and 
giving people information and delightful times. And 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 how many of us, uh, for me, many a time I've preached in a place and after a message, a, a godly older sister would have come up to me and said, Brother Mike, I really appreciate what you said, but have you ever thought about this? And just, just with a little statement opened up a whole vista of truth I never even thought about. <laughs> and so the point is this, that we we must stay teachable. <laughs> we must you know, not allow any measure of gifting in terms of speaking ability or any measure of, of effectual study of the word of God take us to the place where we can't learn from someone else. And here's this man. He's learning from Priscilla, <laughs> a woman, Aquila, a man, humble tent makers, and yet in their home, this man mighty in the scriptures is learning from them. And notice the impact of this. Verse 27 says, when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. So some lovely things in these verses, verse 27. Uh, so he, he's, he wants to go to Achaia. Well, if you're going to go to Achaia, the chief city of Achaia is Corinth. And no doubt he went to Corinth. We know he went to Corinth from 1 Corinthians. So when he leaves Ephesus, clearly there's, there is a gathering of believers there now. Even though Paul hasn't even begun his three-year ministry there, he just he just went there to the synagogue once. But, but there's clearly Christians, brethren, there in Ephesus, because it says when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him. So he got a letter of commendation from the believers in Ephesus to take with him when he went into Achaia. And of course, it's a lovely practice, isn't it? A letter of commendation to say that this brother's, you know, a gifted brother, whatever, whatever you could say about him. And, and, and of course, it meant to be, it's not meant to be just kind of a blank letter, but a personalized letter telling people to receive him and uh, and uh, to receive him as he's one of the lords, to receive him as if it was the Lord himself. And so what a wonderful thing, this letter of commendation. Of course, because there were so many false teachers floating around, this was a safeguard as well. Uh, and so the right letter exhorting the disciples to receive him. And it's good, isn't it, to receive someone in the name of the Lord Jesus. We had visitors at our assembly this last Lord's Day. It was a joy to receive them and to enjoy remembering the Savior with them. And so it says to receive him who, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. Now, here's a, here's a lovely little pattern here. We believe that Corinth was where he was so helpful. Uh, and so just look at 1 Corinthians just for a second. We're just going to see the kind of impact that he had in Corinth. Uh, so much so that uh, some of it wasn't it wasn't his fault, but there were some that just put him on such a pedestal. If you look at chapter one, verse twelve, it says, "Now I, this I say, every one of you says, I am of Paul, I of Apollos, I of Cephas, I of Christ." Some of them he was so mighty in the scriptures and so eloquent that, that there were some that were they became Apollos men. Uh, I love Apollos. He's my man. I, he's my teacher. I love listening to Apollos. He's, he's the man that I, I gather to, so kind of thing. Chapter 3, verse 4, uh, he, he again mentions Apollos. For which one saith, I am of Paul, another I am of Apollos. Are you not carnal? Again, it was a mark of uh, carnality on their part. But uh, certainly he was somebody who Paul trusted. It says, verse 5, who then is Paul, who is Apollos, ministers by whom you believed. So no doubt a number were saved in Corinth through Paul's preaching and through Apollos' preaching. Who is Apollos, but ministers whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered. God gave the increase. So God uses Apollos clearly, very effectively in Corinth. So here's here's what I find so interesting and so wonderful here. 
remember when Paul first went into Corinth, he lodged with Aquila and Priscilla. I want to suggest to you that he probably was a big help to them, even though they were already believers. But remember, this is a man who's had these revelations, amazing revelations in the backside of the desert concerning truth, concerning the church. I suspect that Aquila and Priscilla learned a lot from Paul. Okay, so they learn from him. Then he helps Apollos. And now... Here's Apollos. What is he doing? Verse 27, he's helping them much in Corinth, which had believed through grace. So you notice this? It's kind of a, there's a little bit of a pattern here, isn't there? Paul helps Aquila and Priscilla. Aquila and Priscilla help Apollos. And Apollos now goes back to Corinth where Paul had been used. And Paul had, had, had kind of started the, the work there, sold the seed. Apollos waters it. Uh, he's much help to them. And, and so, again, because he himself has been helped. And so the, the, the thought is this, that when we receive help, it's never just for our own benefit. It's so that we can be a help to someone else. We learn something. Do we look for opportunities to share what we learn with someone else to help them the same way we have been helped? And so it's, it's very practical to see how they're all helping each other and helping each other. Yeah, to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And so it says, not only did he help the saints, those uh, which have believed through grace, he also goes to the very synagogue that had kicked Paul out. It says he mightily convinced the Jews. Well, where would you do that? You see, they, they didn't want Paul there in Corinth, but they didn't know too much about Apollos. So he goes to the very synagogue that had kicked Paul out, and it says he mightily convinced the Jews. And that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Oh, what an impact in the Jewish community. And we said some some Jew, some were saved under his ministry. Uh, and so uh, he says he convinced, a uh, very intense word. It, it means that idea of conviction. Uh, confuting or refuting their arguments, bringing conviction, putting a convicted person to shame, the idea of bringing the truth to them in a powerful way. He met the opposing arguments and brought them down to the ground. That's the idea. He, he mightily convinced the Jews and publicly showing by the scriptures. It was the word of God. He was mighty in the scriptures, and he was able to put it together in such a way that it had such a convincing effect upon his hearers. Some believe from this statement, he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Some actually believe that he wrote the book of Hebrews because he was so mighty in the scriptures. Now, I have to say, I'm not one of them. <laughs> I personally am convinced that Paul wrote Hebrews, but that's another story for another day. But nevertheless, I believe he was capable enough to write the epistle to the Hebrews. So so again, what, what a wonderfully encouraging little section. Paul finishes his missionary journey, but work doesn't just stop because Paul leaves Ephesus. Work is going on in Ephesus. And then in Corinth, he, Paul's not in Corinth, but this man who is so helped by Aquila and Priscilla goes back to Corinth and helps the work there. And so again, we see tremendously encouraging things in this chapter. Most of all, that there are people helping others to grow in their understanding of the word of God. Are we looking for opportunities to help others to grow in their understanding of God's word? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the practicality of it. We thank you for the humility and teachable spirit that was seen in Apollos, that he could allow uh, this uh, humble couple, uh, tent makers, take him to their home, and then, even though he had just preached with such eloquence, allow them to give him further light. And so, Father, we pray that we would be also have that teachable disposition, that spirit of humility, never thinking that we've arrived or even close to arriving, 
but desiring to always grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. That Paul, the great missionary, could say that I might know him, even after serving for 30 years, and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering be made conformable to his death. Lord, we pray that we might have that teachable heart, and so encourage us with your word. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.